So good afternoon. Um, welcome to today's Tom Ramos talk, which is sadly the final presentation of the eight part series titled From Berkeley to Berlin. So today's talk is being recorded. If you missed any of the amazing previous talks, the replays are available on our Lisa website and on the, um, they're on the author series page. And those are um, you who are joining us from WebEx. Please enter your questions for Tom in the Q&A field, and we will ask those on your behalf during the Q&A portion of the talk. For those of you in person um, here in 123, please wait to ask your questions until the microphone comes to you so that our listeners online can also hear. We will be holding a drawing for a chance to win one of Tom's books, and winners will be notified after the talk. I would also like to let everyone know that um, next Thursday, May 12th, at the uh, Livermore Farmers Market at Carnegie Park, the Livermore Heritage Guild will be hosting Tom, and he will be there from four to eight to sign books, and they will have books for sale at the Farmers Market. So if you want to come meet Tom in person and um, have him sign a book, please come out and join us. So um, for our last talk, we would uh, please join me in welcoming Tom Ramos. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. and Mrs. America and all the ships at sea. If you do not recognize that introduction, uh, you are suffering from a physical malady we call youth, and it's uncurable, all right? So, uh, but hopefully Walter Witchell will, will always be remembered. But okay, let's dive into this. Now, last week, we, end, uh, was, we talked about events in 1956 there was an Operation Red Wing in which the uh, laboratory tested six devices, all of them successful. And um, also in 1956, there was a thing called the Nopska Conference held by Admiral Ollie Burke, Chief of Naval Operations at Woods Hole, uh, Massachusetts. And at that, at that conference, uh, the laboratory signed on to a, basically a contract with the United States Navy to provide a warhead for its fleet ballistic missile or the Polaris missile because the Navy was putting together a new, a new weapon in, in our arsenal, the Polaris submarine, and Livermore was tasked to come up with that. So we're gonna, that's where we kind of left off last week and I'd like to pick up now where we're going. All right, now we're coming into 1957. Um, in April of that year, President Eisenhower created a committee uh, that was charged with studying the ability of the United States to withstand a nuclear attack. How vulnerable was the population of the United States uh, to, to a nuclear attack? And the committee, uh, it took its name pr pretty much more popularly from its leader, its first leader of the committee, was uh, a man named Rowan Gaither. He was a San Francisco lawyer, put together a team, and uh, they started their studies on the United States preparedness and wrote a report, the Gator Report. And uh, by the way, two of the main authors of this were Paul Nitsky, who I've mentioned earlier. He, he was a great State Department official back in the uh, Truman administration and later. Uh, another one was a man named George Lincoln, uh, who was, uh, for me personally, was pretty important. He was the head of the Social Sciences Department at West Point when I was a cadet. And Lincoln uh, was a West Point graduate, graduated in 1929, and he was a classmate for Ken Nichols, another officer I talked about, who uh, put together the, uh, the Y-12 plant at Oak Ridge. Uh, and I talked about how the two of them had played a role. Uh, Lincoln also showed up on this committee. He was a member of this Gaither Committee, and he and Nitzka put together this report in which um, I'll highlight one, one sentence here. The USSR will achieve a significant ICBM delivery capability with megaton warheads by 1959, and in the next two years, so are critical, and so on. So on. this is before, remember, this is April 1957. In five and a half months, in October 1957, the Soviets launch a satellite called Sputnik that, that now comes up, and uh, I was a kid at this time, living in Brooklyn, New York. I remember going out with my friends. We'd go out in the uh, sidewalk or on the street, and we'd look up, and we'd see this little white dot going across the sky at night, and that was a Russian satellite, a Russian moon, as it was called. And frankly, it was a bit scary, because 
uh, there, there was the presence of the Soviet Union, and if they put an atomic bomb on that thing, why, what's to keep it from just dropping down out of nowhere? There would be no warning, no nothing. Um, so there was quite a bit of scare, fear built up. And as you see, uh, an, uh, this newspaper report talking about, and he brought up a term called missile gap, in which there was a fear the Soviets were really pushing. They, they just launched a satellite, Sputnik, and they were way ahead. Uh, we had a missile called Vanguard that crashed on takeoff. Um, <clears throat> and they, and it, it really appeared. The Russians were way ahead of us. And the Russians were not making a secret that these things could be used for military purposes. And it created quite a bit of scare. So um, at the time, um, by the way, that, that part, warning us, it was written by the Washington Post, of all things. So there was a time when the Washington Post was concerned with their national security. Uh, if you don't believe that now, but it's true. And anyway, uh, again, as a kid, I remember distinctly, we went to uh, drills. You had your fire drills. You know, we all had to go through fire drills. But then we had fallout drills in which part of the drill was you had to get underneath your desk. I think I've seen once a documentary movie where kids would get under the desk. I just, I remember it distinctly. There was a distinct air of fear in the air. Um, here in Livermore, by the way, there, was a, there were lots of newspaper articles. If you, if you get old copies of local newspapers, of people building fallout shelters in their backyard. And that became almost a pastime. There were quite a few, and people advertising showing their fallout shelter was better. It's almost like a make of car. You know, you had your Cadillac version of fallout shelter and less, but it, it, got, it got. It was a symbol, uh, symptom of the way people were feared uh, from the Soviet Union, for good reason. Um, then, uh, then in the middle of this thing, in about another six months after Sputnik, the premier of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, declares the Soviet Union is going to go through a test moratorium. We're going to stop nuclear testing. And good question would be, why on earth would they do that? I'm, my own feeling is they had, they had developed the hydrogen bomb. They had it. They were on a rough parity with the United States. The United States led the Soviet Union in nuclear tests because we had started earlier and we had programs going. Uh, very robust programs going, and perhaps the Soviet leader felt it's, it would be in the best interest of the Soviet Union we all just stop here while we got parity, otherwise the United States is going to continue to surpass us in time. So he, he, he suggests that Eisenhower at first treated it like a gimmick, but then later on came around and uh, with a lot of political pressure uh, within his administration, within Congress, and decided, OK, we will join the Soviet Union on a test ban, and we will stop testing the first day of November 1958. And that, this was kind of coming down, announced to labs, the laboratories. Now, meanwhile, the Atomic Energy Commission, responsible for conducting this thing, we're just in the middle now of developing weapons like the Polaris warhead. And you do not develop a weapon by just testing it once, and OK, there, it's good to go. You really, these things have to be developed as weapons. They have to be, go through separate kinds of tests. Will they operate in, coal, in the cold temperatures? Will they operate after the vibrations of a launch vehicle? That kind of thing. So um, it's, it's not, that di not that easy to just suddenly uh, stop operations. And the, the director for military applications at the Atomic Energy Commission at the time was this man, Alfred C. Uh, Starbird, Major General. Uh, Starbird was uh, an excellent officer in the Army, um, West Point grad. He graduated in West Point in 1933. He graduated uh, a few weeks after the George Lincoln I just mentioned had graduated um, in 1929. Starbird arrives a few weeks later. He goes through and graduates in 1933. He's in the Olympics in 1936, the same Olympics where Jesse Owens was breaking all of his Olympic records. Stubbard was also in the uh, military pentathlon as an athlete. He was in the Corps of Engineers, went assignment to assignment. In World War II, he was part of the Normandy invasion. He was part of Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa. Had a stellar uh, um, career throughout the war. And then after the war, he got involved with the nuclear testing going on in the Pacific. And then he was appointed to be the head, the director of military applications for the Atomic Energy Commission. And when he realizes the, the um, Eisenhower announces the, the secession of nuclear testing for the United States, 
and you only got about 14 months for that to occur, he sends a letter to the laboratories asking them what the long-term effects of this could be. And it's interesting in the answers, that I read uh, one, you got one letter from Norris Bradbury, the director of Los Alamos. By this time, Bradbury had been the director for 12 years, and I got the sense that he was maybe just tired or fatigued from the, from the uh, 12 years in that position he was in, because when he, what he writes is talks about basically he's ready, he's ready for succession of testing. We have successful weapons, and maybe we ought to be reverting our attention more to scientific endeavors, which carries quite a bit of weight because later on, Los Alamos will develop some big scientific centers like LAMP, the Los Alamos Meson facility, and other types of uh, great physics laboratories were going on, but he was thinking more in those terms. The letter he got from Livermore was distinctly different. He says, wait a minute, there are lots of new ideas we want to we wanna pursue, and uh, so no, so testing would not be a good idea at this particular time. It was, it was distinctly different, the message coming from, the two, from his two weapons laboratories. But in any case, uh, Bradbury had also written a letter the previous year to Herb York, and he copied it to, Brad, to uh, Starbird, in which Bradbury proposed, well, let's separate responsibilities between the laboratories. Los Alamos will take over so many warheads. Livermore can take over these kind of warheads and that. And uh, York responded, no, that's not a good idea. Both laboratories should be, should be uh, very competent in all aspects of nuclear weapon designs so that we can complement each other and not separate us into different bins. But Starbird worked on that letter and he, started, he had a call for two meetings, one to be held at Los Alamos and another in, um, to be held at San Francisco, close to Livermore, to, uh, to go over what the responsibilities will be for future years. And this will, this will occur around also same 1956, right around the same time as that letter. As a result of the two meetings, uh, representatives from Los Alamos volunteered and they took control of about eight major projects like the Atlas ICBM, the Thor ICBM, other big projects. And Livermore got two, got two. And these were tactical weapon systems. These were small, relatively small warhead systems uh, for the Army and maybe aircraft in the Navy and the Air Force. And that was it. And that, that, uh, that by the way, that letter that was brought to my attention, I, I read that, first became aware of that letter uh, in a PhD dissertation for, by a woman named Sybil Francis who was assigned here at the laboratory back in the 1980s working for Mike May, and, and she wrote her PhD dissertation, this brought up, and it started some ideas in my mind going through this. I said, this is interesting that this would happen. And <clears throat> I started following through on that, and I started looking at nuclear tests that occurred within the next 24 months after that. And it reflects what I show here, that Los Alamos took responsibility for a majority of these, quite a few projects you know, for weapon systems. And what happens though is when you take responsibility for a weapon system like that, that requires several confidence tests. So you can't, like I said, you can't just do this in one test. And so you have quite a bit of logistics, if you will, to support each of these systems. With eight systems to support, that is a lot of work. Uh, Livermore only had two, so they had a quarter as many. And so literally it had much more free time to pursue new ideas and to look at new ideas for that. And when I look at what happened with the test for the next two years, it bears it out. Uh, Livermore, it was a bonanza two years for the Livermore. It came out with at least two new primaries that would be used for a nuclear stockpile and two new uh, secondaries that would also be prominent within the stockpile, which is quite a bit of production for within a period 18 to 24 months. So anyway, it opened up and Livermore kind of fell in and the laboratory, the two laboratories fell into certain roles at this time, which I think were very important for our nation. Um, Los Alamos was the parent laboratory, had 10 years seniority over Livermore, and was very proud of that fact. And, and one of their measures of merit, I think, were how many weapons went into the nuclear stockpile that came from Los Alamos, it was providing the deterrent stockpile of the United States. Livermore, of course, was the new kid in the block and was trying to prove itself and was more enamored with new ideas. He had, had a younger staff, if you will, at Livermore, and they were pursuing newer ideas and they were much more attuned to trying out the newer ideas and they just thought that the new ideas eventually would lead them into uh, providing actual support into the nuclear stockpile. 
And in that sense, the two laboratories very much complemented each other. And, and that grew right into the 1960s. And I think that was really good for the nation because it did act, the two laboratories kind of acted uh, in different roles, but they kind of spurred each other on. You know, uh, Los Alamos spurring Livermore, that they, well, you, you need to be productive. What do you got to show for your work? And Los Alamos basically being looking at Livermore saying, well, we cannot sit back on our laurels, otherwise Livermore will be overtaking us. But for the moment, the new ideas and a lot of the innovative things that were coming out were coming out of Livermore. And that, that, as I said, would have a profound effect on us. <clears throat> OK. Um, so now we're going into this. We're now by 1957. York decides to consolidate the weapons program. And remember now, at the time, you have the Livermore Hectaton Group designing the atomic bombs. And you have the Livermore Megaton Group, led by Harold Brown, designing the secondaries or the thermonuclear warheads. And now he's consolidating these things so that the hectaton group will now become into a division. And all of the activities, a lot of the testing activities, especially out at Site 300, will all be consolidated within a B program or a B division. It creates a B division. And he appoints Johnny Foster as the head of B division. And now he's consolidated this. It's more efficient. It'll run. Johnny and Johnny will take charge of it. In the same way, the thermonuclear activities will be consolidated into A division uh, under Harold Brown. Now, there are some who ask, including myself, well, oh, wait, you got the primary, and that's B division, and then you got the secondary, and that's A division. Why isn't the other way around? Well, Johnny Foster asked me the same question when I was interviewing him, so, so I don't know, uh, but we have our theories. But be that as it may, you now have, instead of the hectaton group and the megaton group, you got B division and A division. Uh, going, pursuing what's going to happen. At the same time, I also mentioned um, York had adopted Lawrence's management system, the matrix management system. And you might remember I had a um, sentence on one of the slides saying York considered himself part of this thing. He expected to be the laboratory director for one or two years, and then he would move on to the next, to the next program. Well, it's five years, and York was asked by the Secretary of Defense if he would take over and start an organization within the Pentagon to bring the Pentagon more science savvy, to make, to make a, a more of a scientific, basically scientific based organization within the Department of Defense to anchor, the, somewhat anchor the Defense Department with more modern science. And he wanted York to run it. York was amenable to that. And in 1956, 57, he had conversations with Lawrence saying, well, I think boss would think it's time I move. And Lawrence said, no, you can't move right now. We're right in the middle of trying to develop these things. You can't move, can't move. So the two of them had their discussions. But within 18 months later, York went back. And then Lawrence said, fine, go ahead. And so um, forget the exact date. But I think it was early 1958. York leaves the laboratory. And he heads off to the Pentagon. And he creates uh, the Advanced Research Programs Agency, ARPA. Uh, and he becomes the founder and first director of, of ARPA at the Pentagon. And that is, that does become a very major uh, scientific program within the Defense Department, starting many of the programs. In fact, the drones that fly over uh, during, during our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, all those drones, there, all those were products that came out of ARPA over the years. But anyway, so York's, York's on his way there. And so the, the, the plan was the T division leader, was Mark Mills, and the plan was that Mark Mills would succeed Herb York. But as an interim thing, because uh, Mills now had to be reviewed and approved by the regents of the University of California. Now remember, the, the laboratory is still working under the contract that Lawrence himself basically put together and negotiated with the regents of the University of California to start Los Alamos in 1943, to start Livermore in 1952. We're all under that same contract that Manhattan Project contract. And so it's the, it's the regents of the University of California that really decide who the laboratory director is going to be. Because it's still, again, remember, it's still part of the Rad Lab of the University of California. So while they're going through that process, they decide to make Edward Teller the interim director of the laboratory. Mills will become his assistant, where as soon as he's approved, then Mills will become the director. Um, now, 1957 comes in. and we're, uh, we're going to have two operations coming up. In 1957, it's Operation Plumbob, which will occur in Nevada. 
1958, there's going to be an Operation Hardtack in uh, the Pacific. And the stakes are now, by this time, everyone's aware that President Eisenhower is about to announce a test ban, which he did, that's going to occur in the first day of November 1958. No more testing. So 31 October 1958 is the last day you can conduct the test. And there are lots of programs that need to be certified for the nuclear stockpile by then. So this is a whirlwind of activity. The basic plans, though, within, within the designers within the laboratory is to use Plumbob in 1957 to put down the first iteration of the warheads that they're going to have and put them in, make sure that there's a proof of principle these things work, and in an Operation Hardtack, actually weaponize them, put them in their weapons configuration and test them at that time just to make sure everything works. That's the general plan. And uh, Johnny uh, Foster, his, his thing, one of the things he kept to his soul, he wanted a weapon for the Army to help, a tactical weapon like nuclear artillery, to help, again, those massive, massive uh, human wave attacks that were witnessed during the Korean War. The Army badly wanted something for the battlefield that would keep these massive human armies coming in from overwhelming uh, United States forces, and that would be a nuclear artillery cell. And, and Johnny was very much... Uh, uh, passionate about providing that type of support to the Army. So one of his programs is going to be come up with a, a nuclear artillery shell for the Army that's highly friendly, workable, very usable, and uh, ubiquitous. But of course, he also has to come up with a primary, with an atomic device, to drive the secondary for the Polaris warhead. After all, the, you know, the, the laboratory agreed we would do this for the Navy, and we would do it within, what, three years, four years, by 1961. That was the promise that Edward made at Nopska, during the Nopska conference. So that's Johnny's two big goals. Harold Brown, the biggest thing is he has to come through with a warhead for, for the um, Polaris, certainly. But he'll have two other roles to go. But his main thing is he has to come through with the promise that was made. OK, so now going into the B Division activities, Foster, he was. He was a very natural leader, and when, um, when, he, when his people went out to uh, any Weetok or Bikini out in the South Pacific, he brought his whole division out there with him. Whether, whether a physicist or an engineer had, was directly involved with the test or not, he had him out there, kept as a unit, and kept a good unit cohesion in that way. And uh, during Red Wing, when they were doing the Swan, the Swallow, and the Swift, you remember from last week, they were doing those devices, in between those times, he got a Quonset hut. The physicist designers would go into it. They'd sit down. There's, now, there's no computers. There's no nothing, actually. It's just an open doorway on either end to let the breeze go through. But there is a blackboard, which was absolutely essential. Anytime you have two or more physicists sitting in a room, you've got to have a blackboard in there. And they had the blackboard. And, and so Johnny's theme always was, what are we going to do for next year? What, what device do we come up with for next year? Jim Wilson, their theoretician, he gets up there and he comes up with a, an idea. Jeff Birnbaum, Morris Schaff, some of the other designers. Birnbaum was the lead designer for the Swan. He gets up there and he starts revising Wilson's idea. He says, well, yeah, Jim, but what about this and that? And then all of them start coming in and they all start making their marks on the blackboard. And they start arguing among themselves about this, that do we really need that? Well, not, and, how, and we're going to make this thing small, it has to fit. And how do we more appropriately create a primary that more efficiently drives energy into a secondary. Is there something we could do to make that work better? These kinds of things were going on. And so over the course of a week or two, they're in there. And then when they come back out of any retalk, they come back to Livermore, Foster announces a program. He says, we now have the Robin program. And the goal of which is to design a much more efficient primary that will, feed, that, uh, will serve uh, that will give much more efficient energy for an atomic device, okay? And in the months to follow, two immediate models will come out, the Robin A and the Robin B. The Robin A was using uranium as a fuel because plutonium at the time was still critically short. So they decided to come up with a uranium type of device. But it was cumbersome uh, and annoyance. They tested it, it worked, but it wasn't the cat's meow. And the Robin B was a plutonium version of the same ideas, and that worked perfectly. That really gave a yield exactly what they wanted. They now had a device that you could hold up in your hands, 
that performed as an atomic bomb. So it was a, it was a real tour de force, if you will. And the Robin would become, they tested it several times in Plum Bob, Operation Plum Bob. Each time it worked precisely as they had said it would. Now, the Robin never became a weapon, all right? So uh, it never, never became part of a weapon system. But it's, it became a conceptual idea of how to design an atomic device that met a lot of the criteria needed for a futuristic type. And so in that sense, it became the, the mother, of, if you will, of the modern American uh, atomic uh, nuclear force, okay? And, and it is true, if you, if you were able to see. Now, uh, when I was giving classified lectures here in this hall um, <clears throat> and in a hallway across, across the way, uh, I, I was able to go into and show you the details of what they were doing. It was marvelous. It really was a phenomenal achievement using every possible uh, angle of physics you can think of to accomplish this. Remember now, the, the SWAN had gone through, what, 100 hydro tests at Site 300. So these guys, when they were sitting in that Quonset hut in Inuitak, they didn't need a computer to know how a shockwave would react with the metal in a particular way. And you know, so they, they, it was almost in their souls how they could put that together. They were really professionals by this time, and it showed. So now you now have the birth of a very modern looking atomic bomb for the stockpile. And meanwhile, back on the, and then the other group, B, uh, A Division, I'm sorry, A Division, coming up with the, the thermonuclear uh, targets, uh, Brown announced three goals. One was to get a gravity bomb for the Strategic Air Force. Second one was to come up with a weapon for these ICBMs that were being built. You had Atlas, Thor, there were going to be others, Minuteman would later, would come out later. Um, so we'll come up with a standby for that. But the third one, most importantly, was come up with a warhead for the Polaris submarine. So that was his three goals. And, and frankly, those are also large, medium, and small, uh, the way they go. So the Lodge became, uh, they used Mike May's design for the bassoon that had occurred in 1956, and that became the basis. And they took that and modified it, changed it. May, uh, May took over that, and he made major modifications to this thing, but eventually evolved it into what would become the B-41 bomb, which had oh, about, what, 20 years service in the nuclear stockpile and was the largest yield weapon in the history of the U.S. stockpile. So it was Huge success for Mike, his first, practically only, uh, when he got involved with design work. So it was a hell of an achievement for a young man from Marseille, France. Uh, the backup for a, for a ICBM missile would be a follow-on to the, the W-27, which had the, also been tested the year before, and uh, which was the warhead for the Regulus cruise missile for the Navy. And that was also being driven, and there was one test coming on with her. Finally, they're going to do a proof of principle on this very modern. I can't give you the nickname because this actually would become a weapon. Um, but Mark Mills, as now deputy director of the laboratory, he goes out to any wee talk, and he's <clears throat> and he's out exploring, making sure everything's working, and he wants to double check that the diagnostics are all set up correctly for the test for the warhead. And on his way out to an island to check it in, in the atoll. Um, he's in a helicopter. The helicopter goes into a rain squall that suddenly appeared out of nowhere. The pilot lost his orientation when he entered this, the rain squall, lost his sense of equilibrium. The helicopter flipped over and crashed into the water, flipped and actually flipped down, and Mark was killed in the crash. Uh, so we'll never know what kind of laboratory director he would have been, but it did turn out that the, the, the operation continued. The warhead he was going out to try to help make sure it was run correctly, it did perform correctly. It, did, it would become a warhead for an ICBM. But we lost, we lost one of our possible leaders at the time. Um, the third, the flute, follow on to the flute now for the uh, Polaris warhead. The first thing they came up with is the new musical instrument will be the piccolo. So the piccolo is coming up. It was a smaller version of the flute, and it was tested in variations. Uh, something, in a single test, they would come up with three variations of this. They were very, very, uh, very in inventive in how they could get as much information out of a single test, and they would have several devices kind of scooting together. But they did it 
and it had, uh, I think there's all grand total of six variations of this thing, and they came up with the best, the one that worked the best. Each one of the variations, by the way, was, was a significant innovation in itself. But they came up with a, a more or less better, better looking one, um, and they laid the groundwork for what would be the Polaris warhead. They, they would then go on, and they would test another thing called the whistle that was even smaller than the piccolo to, to get themselves on, onto the right path. Okay, so it looks like things are moving. Okay. All right, now a sidestep on this, uh, just a quick sidestep. At the time, uh, this, uh, this period we're talking about, 1957-58, anyway, there was a young man uh, born in Boston. His parents were Greek, and uh, when he was still a young man, the family moved back to Athens, Greece. And uh, they were there, and his name was Nicholas Christophilus. And Nicholas is there, and he goes to a tech high school, and he's, he loves technical subjects, mathematics and engineering. And then World War II breaks out, and the German Wehrmacht invades Greece. And so he's there during the occupation of his, his country is now occupied by the German army. And during that time, he, he actually has a job at an elevator factory in Athens. And during his, any spare time he had, he would just absorb physics textbooks and other technical textbooks. And after the war, he, he had he absorbed all of this knowledge, self, basically self-taught physicist, and he wrote a letter to the Rad Lab giving a design for a revolutionary to, new kind of accelerator that the Rad Lab might be interested in. And, it, they, and they went over it, and they looked it over, and it turns out that what he was proposing was actually an identical to a thing that had just been invented by Edwin McMillan. Edwin McMillan is, if you recall, was the member of the Rad Lab who, who uh, with Glenn Seaborg, they had discovered plutonium along with neptunium. Uh, but but uh, Macmillan had come up with a device. Now, I know I promise sometimes, we got a little bit of time, I promise sometimes not to uh, get too much into the physics, I apologize, but what was happening is, it's kind of cool. Uh, when you have a centrifugal force, when you want a particle going in a circle, it's a basically uh, the law of physics comes down. It's mv squared over r, right? And it just happens, and this is one of the discoveries Lawrence made, which made it great, was uh, when you have the B field, which, ca which causes this centrifugal force, centripetal force, if you will, that um, as, the v, as the particle's velocity picks up, um, then so too the radius will go mv squared over r. So as v is getting bigger, uh, R also gets bigger, and they two offset each other, and so the overall, the overall B field requirement remains constant. So you can have a, basically a more or less constant alternating B field, and you can use that in the cyclotron to keep it going, and that, that's what made one of the great properties of the cyclotron was this. Well, that's all great, except that as these particles are getting faster and faster and faster, if you want to make them even go faster, if you want to get a really, really energetic the particles now are getting close to the speed of light. And as they approach the speed of light, relativistic effects take effect. And one of the, one of the aspects, a relativistic effect, is the mass of the particle gets bigger. And these deuterons that are going around, they're now getting bigger. So now, as originally when you were doing your calculations, mass was considered constant, but the V squared over R could vary, but they varied in such a way to keep the B field constant. Now, with relativity, that's no longer true because mass now is not constant, but mass is increasing. And so Hunt's beta even wrote a paper that now there's a maximum energy that you can achieve with a cyclotron after that relativity closes, you shut you down. Well, what uh, Edwin McMillan came up with was an invention called the synchrocyclotron, which took that into account and it allowed you now to get into even relativistic regimes, and you still could allow the cyclotron to continue to work. What Nicholas Christophilus had suggested in his letter to the, that he'd written you know, from this Greek elevator <laughs> factory in Athens and sent a letter to the Rad Lab was the synchrocyclotron. He had actually come up on his own accord. He'd come up with the same ideas of how to overcome the relativistic effects. So this is a fairly sophisticated letter coming from a very young man. Um, so although originally it was set down, so well, he's just, he's just repeating what Macmillan had done, Herb York read it and was impressed enough that uh, York offered Christophilus a job at the laboratory. Christophilus accepted it, came, came to Livermore, and worked at the laboratory in the Sherwood project, which was the fusion reactor pro project that was headed by Dick Post, that I mentioned a couple of times. You may or may not remember it. 
but they were trying to create a fusion reactor. And so uh, Christophilus changes his, his energies to now making a reactor that would create fusion energy. Then comes Sputnik, and uh, with the fear that he felt as much as any other American, he really felt that the Russians were going to have a significant military advantage over the United States, and he feared that the Russians would use their new rocket technology to launch um, nuclear weapons into the United States. By launching rockets into outer space, they'd come down and hit us. And he, and he said this would give them a significant military advantage. And he tried to come up with how could we defend the United States from that. And he came up with an idea of, well, what if we use a nuclear weapon and detonate it above the atmosphere in outer space in what we call the magnetosphere. And boom, when the, when the weapon goes off, it releases lots of radioactive elements, which decay by giving off electrons, but in any, any case, the nuclear explosion would create a cloud of electrons. And uh, Christophilus did some calculations and said the natural magnetic field of the Earth would capture those electrons and would ha capture them into a belt, and they would stay there in the magnetosphere, magnetosphere around, around the Earth. And so if the Russians tried to come and they re-enter above the United States, the electrons would go in and functionally kill the, 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 uh, the weapon. And so the weapon wouldn't work when it came back, back into Earth. This was, frankly, a 1950s version of Star Wars, Ronald Reagan's Star Wars in the 1980s. This was the same kind of thing. This was a way to protect us from, from our rockets coming down with nuclear weapons. The idea was, came out, the, uh, the uh, science advisor to the president, Wiesner, he was a former professor at MIT, he, he came out to Livermore. They had a big conference. They went over in detail everything Christophilus was saying, and he said, you know, he's right. This would work. This actually could destroy a Russian missile. And so um, Herb York, who's now at ARPA, he had some Defense Department money, and so he used some of that money to then conduct a Project Argus, which was to test out Christophilus's idea. And August, uh, because of the magnetic fields and this, that, and the other thing, there were only certain parts of the, United, of the world that you wanted to test this at. One was over the island, Iceland, which is not a good idea, but the other one was over an island in the South Atlantic, owned by the British. It was called Goff Island. And so they were going to launch these. These were very, very low-yield weapons, one kiloton, one maybe two kiloton weapons. And they would launch them in a rocket, and once it hit the magnetosphere, they explode the rocket, and then you would, you would observe the electrons. And right before that, we had pioneer satellites going up, uh, looking at different portions of the magnetosphere uh, around the Earth. And in fact, while Christophilus was doing his calculations, he says, you know, there's probably already a band of electrons up there uh, being held by the Earth's magnetic field. And he predicted what later would be called the Van Allen belts that were discovered by the Pioneer uh, satellite. So even before the Van Allen belts had been discovered, Christophilus was, was actually predicting that. Well, they conducted the, probably the three nuclear tests over the island of Goff in the South Atlantic. And they, uh, I think it was in August 1958, pa, pa, pa. And everything worked. The, the Pioneer satellites, they could see the electrons. And they just, OK, it all worked except the magnetic, uh, the magnetic field of the Earth is not strong enough to hold on to these electrons, and they escape. They escape. They don't stay there. So it was a good idea. It's just it would not work on Earth. Okay, and so it was laid to rest. But in the meantime, news of this, of the great, uh, the great ideas coming from this guy, reached Greece, and the Queen of Greece, Queen Federica, decided to come out to the laboratory to honor a Greek, a son of Greece, now working in an American laboratory. So she's coming out. To, uh, to the laboratory. And I know I've talked, to, I've talked to a guy who is a student here at Livermore, and he said he was in class one day, and the teachers announced, well, children, the Queen of Greece is coming. And the first thing was, well, what is a Queen of Greece? And of course, they're thinking of a frying pan, the Greece in a frying pan. And, and no, 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 they had to explain that Greece was not in a frying pan. Greece was actually a country. And so they gave them little Greek flags, and the children lined up along East Avenue, and street, and the Queen of Greece, Queen Frederica, came through and had a nice parade, and the kids were all waving to the Queen of Greece, and she comes up to the front, for the front gates, and I found uh, Jeff Sahida, our archivist here at the laboratory, was kind enough, I said, Jeff, do we have any pictures of Queen Frederica? And he found this in a local newspaper thing, and there she is, the Queen Third, and that's uh, Sterling Colgate on the left, next to Nick Christophilus, the gentleman I was just talking about, and Edward Teller on the far right, and they were all greeting Queen Frederica. So, 
Livermore made the news for one day in 1958 for a son of Greece. All right, and at the same time now, um, Eisenhower agrees. Now, his reliance on massive retaliation as a defense strategy of the United States allowed him to, uh, allowed him to let the conventional forces of the United States atrophy because the main defense of the United States under the Eisenhower administration, again, was going to be our nuclear weapons. And so the defense budgets went down for our, for our forces to a point where the United States Army had, was down to 700,000 troops versus the Soviet Army having 2.5 million troops. So we were vastly outnumbered outmanned in military prowess by this time. Uh, but we were going into a nuclear test ban, and Eisenhower was concerned that the Soviets would cheat, and he asked Lawrence to uh, join a, uh, a group that was created, it's called a group of experts, to go over verification technologies to see, can we verify this test ban to make sure the Russians are not cheating? Lawrence agrees, and he goes out to Geneva to study this in 1958. And while he's doing that, he comes down with yet another attack of colitis. Uh, he can feel it. Uh, his brother, his, his medical brother, tells him, get back to Berkeley as soon as you can. So he does. Uh, he comes back. He goes into San Francisco General Hospital. They remove, his, they remove his intestines, but within a few hours, he's dead. Okay? And he's just, uh, he's 57 years old. So it's a huge loss for all of us. Uh, he leaves a, a hell of a legacy. You know, he creates a, he creates a machine becomes uh, one of the great experimental apparatus to, to just study the nucleus of the atom. Uh, and he's the creator of our laboratory. And he, he was a great influential presence in keeping the United States vigilant with these nuclear threats that were emerging from these authoritarian states, first from the Nazis and later from the communists. So it's a great loss to our country. But in 1958, we lost Ernest Lawrence. By the way, uh, after his death, the regents of the University of California immediately met, and they immediately, they, not immediately, but they made a quick decision. The University of California Radiation Lab, UCRL, they're going to change the name now to the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory. So at that point, our name changed from UCRL to Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, LRL. At the time. We're still all together with Berkeley, but we have a new name now, named after our founder. Okay. Now, back, we're in 58. Um, Harold Brown still has that responsibility for um, coming up with a warhead for Polaris. And he comes to his deputy, Carl Hausman, whose picture is up, up there. I, I introduced Carl. He'd come to us from the Matterhorn Project, where he'd worked with John Wheeler at Princeton. He came here. Yes, he's another West Pointer. And I, I bring up in my book, for those of you who have got a chance to read my book, how it, this is a little bit personal for me, but the Army uh, went through a period, uh, in basically in the late 60s into the 70s and 80s, in, in which it seemed to be like a dismissal of really smart officers. <laughs> These guys who were highly technically oriented uh, seemed to be not fitting so well. And so it struck me how important these officers who had technical skills were to the defense of our country. This, now, I, I highlight the Army, of course, because I'm highlighting Livermore. Uh, uh, but Starbird was a West Pointer, Corps of Engineers, Carl Hausman, Corps of Engineers, West Pointer. Um, but um, the Navy had the same thing, and the Air Force. Hap Arnold, uh, the first Commander-in-Chief of the Air Force, he had a graduate degree in aeronautical engineering from Caltech, for goodness sake. He was not a dummy. Jimmy Doolittle had an art aeronautical engineering degree from MIT. These guys, when they, what they were achieving was not, because, not by dumb luck. These guys were very in, technically intelligent. They knew how to drive. They were leaders, and they could drive stuff. And same, as I mentioned, in the Army. We had gentlemen like Starbird, Leslie Groves, Ken Nichols, the, those names I bring up. These were very, very intelligent military officers that came in. And I just hope, for the military's sake, that we get back to that, that we appreciate the talents of very smart, technically-oriented officers because they bring a lot to the table. Call is one of those men, Call Hausman. Uh, so Harold Brown, Call has, the, uh, Call has this particular thing. Uh, by the way, getting trained, these, all these guys had gone to graduate school, Caltech, MIT. I know for, for me personally, uh, working for Professor Erwin Pless at MIT was a great, very, for me, it learned, I learned so much 
from my education, from, from being tutored by gentlemen like Erwin, uh, that made me much better at learning at what I had to do. And I think the Army benefited from that. And so too, I think Brown understood that with Call. He had a guy who's a top-notch physicist, albeit he didn't have a PhD, didn't, you know, the Army didn't allow him to get a, you know, didn't give him the time to get it, but no, he wasn't stupid. He was extremely smart, but Call had at least the discipline of not only did you have to do something, but you had to do it by a certain amount of time. The concept that uh, if you do this, but you do it after this time, then it's no good to me anymore. With, you know, that's not usually inherent in every, everybody, but with people with military backgrounds, that kind of mission orientation is very much in their souls. They understand it. They know what it means to have things done within a particular schedule. And Brown understood that, which is why he transferred the leadership of getting a Polaris warhead out to Call. He said, Call, I need, we need to finish this up. I now need a warhead for Polaris. You know, Call basically, yes, sir. And he puts together a team. It's Ken Bentel, Peter Moultrup, some other, uh, Jim, Jim Frank, other icons of the lab. But Hausman's leading it, puts it together. Within 90 days, they'll have a warhead ready to be tested. And when it's tested, it gives the highest yield to weight, which is the metrics used in, in nuclear weapons so as, for efficiency. It's the most efficient warhead ever tested. And they came up with that thing from start to finish, 90 days. It's a phenomenal achievement that they had. And they put it together just in time. And they're working with some icons with the Navy, because Carl then goes and works with the Navy. The Navy just as much had their own technical experts, Admiral Rayburn, heads the special projects office at the Navy, and he gets uh, Captain Levering Smith, who takes the impossible task of building a missile capable of fitting inside a submarine and can still reach 1,000 nautical miles using a solid fuel component. Smith does that, and then Admiral Wertheim, uh, now at the time commander, Bob Wertheim, who then put together, how do you take the Livermore warhead and integrate it into this tiny missile? and make it all seamless and work. And Call's a member of his committee. They all work together with Lockheed, building uh, so many of the key components, and they get it done. And there's President Kennedy in the bite, and he's watching, again, uh, as I showed last time, he's watching a, a launch of the Polaris missile. And it's in time for the January, uh, it's in time for Kennedy's inauguration in January of 1961. Um, when this happens, um, Right after Kennedy's inaugurated, uh, he goes through a thing called the Bay of Pigs invasion. It's an invasion of Cuba by Cuban expatriates. It's a debacle. It doesn't go over very well. And Khrushchev and his staff get an idea that this guy is not another Eisenhower. This guy can be taken. I mean, Eisenhower was commander in chief, European theater of operations in World War II. Kennedy was the commander of a PT boat. You know, the feeling was there was this prejudicial feeling that we can take this guy. He can be intimidated. Now, some of the stuff I'm about to show is, relates to today's world. Uh, I'm, the, I'm just saying, OK? So <laughs> I'm just saying, OK? <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, Khrushchev thinks he can come in and he can intimidate this brand new young president. And so uh, a few months after the Bay of Pigs fiasco, Kennedy goes to Vienna, Austria, and he meets with Khrushchev, the premier of Soviet Union. And Khrushchev literally tries to intimidate Kennedy, and sometimes just leaning over him, pointing his, pointing his finger down at him. And he gives him an ultimatum. He says, you have six months. By the end of this year, all of your troops got to be out of Berlin because the Red Army is coming in, and we will invest Berlin. Any, any foreign troops there, will, we will invest, and we will kill. We'll capture or kill them. Get out. I'm warning you now. Get out of Berlin. And um, Kennedy takes it very seriously. Uh, I read through notes when he, after this, he's, he's, he's a bit shaken. He takes it seriously. He takes Khrushchev's warnings very seriously. When he goes back to his national security staff at the White House, he tells them, we're not going to have a time, a uh, we're not going to have a quiet time. My presidency is not going to be quiet. I expect we're going to have a thermonuclear war within a year. He goes over to the, um, but he's adamant. It never crosses his mind. When I get everything I read, one thing I'll say this for John F. Kennedy, never once do I get even inkling that he's even considering 
pulling out of Berlin. He's not going to abandon two and a half million Germans to communism. That never enters his mind. He's just, how am I going to handle this when they come? How are we going to handle this war that's about to come? He said, if we go to war, we go to war. He solidified his alliance with France and with Great Britain. So he, they were all in it together. Charles de Gaulle gets on a public state, makes a public statement. We are with the United States. We will even go to war to defend Great Britain. The Minister of Defense in Great Britain gets up and says, we are prepared to uh, uh, honor our treaty obligations. We will defend Berlin. This is very serious stuff. Uh, Kennedy goes over to the Pentagon and he, and he meets with uh, General Lucius Clay uh, and says, well, what's the plan, General? And so, yes, sir, if the Red Army invest Berlin, then we can have a tank heavy task force, let's say take off out of Frankfurt, out of West Germany or go across East Germany. Now, um, I remember reading through this. I was reading through all of this stuff. I was shocked and I could not find the document where I was reading this. So I did not put it in my book because I can't back it up. But I do remember reading, maybe this came out of uh, documents at the Pentagon, but I do remember reading where, where basically Kennedy was being told, we will send a task force in to relieve the siege. Any Russian formations that come to try to cut off the task force will be met with tactical nuclear weapons. Kennedy basically says, okay. But Kennedy sits back and in that previous picture where he's looking at that Polaris, and I've got correspondence where he's writing to the Navy, this is clearly a deterrent force that is important to our nation. Kennedy sits back and he realizes that, that Khrushchev knows the United States now has a weapon that you can't bomb it, you can't sneak attack it, you can't do anything because they're in submarines, you don't know where they are, and believe it, there are 10 submarines now floating in the Arctic Ocean right off your coast. If you do anything stupid, we will annihilate you. And, and Kennedy knows, Khrushchev knows that, and Kennedy later admits it gave him the backbone to stand up to Khrushchev and just stand up to him. So Kennedy had to run this difficult course of being adamant. We're not going to pull back. I'm not giving an inch. No, we're going to honor our commitments to Berlin. But Kennedy also is not provocative. He doesn't try to push Khrushchev into doing some irrational act, which Khrushchev would be perfectly capable of doing. So he, he did this very good balancing act, and how he did it was remarkable, but it worked. Okay. Now, that ends, goes back. Then Khrushchev announces the Soviet Union is now going to resume nuclear testing. And in a matter of, uh, <clears throat> I believe it was uh, yeah, 65 days, they conduct 45 nuclear tests, uh, 14 of them above a megaton. And one of them is the Tsar Bomber in Nova Tsutamalaya which was uh, 58 megatons, the largest weapon ever detonated in the history of the world. Uh, and there's a picture coming to Zabamba. And it was clearly meant to intimidate the United States. You're intimidating us. Look, you better pay attention or you will pay the consequences. We have bombs that will obliterate you. Kennedy stands up to him, doesn't give an inch. And, and his instincts were right. Eventually, Khrushchev blinks, pulls back, quits threatening, and they build the Berlin Wall. That's why the Berlin Wall was built. They build the Berlin Wall to separate East Berlin from West Berlin, keep the East Berliners on their side, and that ends the crisis. But then um, Kennedy reflects on this, how close we came to a thermonuclear war. And six months later, he arranges, he's gonna go visit. He wants, he says, he wants to visit the physicist at Livermore who gave him the weapons, that gave him the backbone to stand up to Khrushchev. And he flies out. And on the 23rd of March, 1962, he arrives at the Rad Lab to meet. Now, Johnny Foster, by this time, is the director of the laboratory. Johnny's, Johnny's going to give him some lectures. And he's going to show Kennedy the actual Polaris warhead. In fact, I have movies showing him. Kennedy's really into it. In fact, at one point, Kennedy's so interested, he pulls up a chair, and he sits there, and he, he puts his hands, he puts his uh, chin on his hands, just looking at all the aspects. Kennedy was not a fool, he was not dumb. That man had a lot of capability about him. It's very clear in all of his activities. Um, there he is, that picture on the far right. He's standing in front of the Rad Lab. After that picture was taken, he turns around to go into the lab to get his briefings from Johnny. But he, as he walks across the lobby, there are some physicists there from the laboratory. One of them is Mike May. And I asked Mike, I said, Mike, what was it like meeting President Kennedy? He says, Tom, the president came into the lobby, stepped across, had a big smile on his face, 
came up to me, stuck his hand out, shook my hand, and said, thank you so much. Mike said it was the proudest day of my life. I said, when, after I hear that, you got to, you know, Christ, i got to get this story out. People should know what these individuals did to thwart the Soviet Union. All right, now, after Johnny gives his briefings, he introduces the PAL system. I think for the sake of time, time I'm not going to go into that. But there is the... Uh, Berkeley Football Stadium holds 65,000. There are 85,000 people there now. Kennedy gets up on a platform, and he says, the world is safer for democracy now. And then he comes up with this classic statement, I am forced to confront an uncomfortable truth. His, his administration is the new frontier. He says, the new frontier may well owe more to Berkeley than to Harvard. It's the public acknowledgment that you guys out here, we all, we the American citizens, owe you for saving us from a thermonuclear war. Hell of an achievement, don't you think? Within, remember the beginning of this series of lectures, we had the Root, the Ray, and the Kuhn events, and all these debacles. We, we started from rock bottom, and we built up until now we we're supplying the United States with a strategic deterrent that kept it, so that even the president comes out to thank and acknowledge the accomplishment of the laboratory. How nice it would have been if Lawrence would have been alive to see his laboratory getting credit from the president for what they had done for the country. All right, all this is written up. I've kind of quickly gone through this. It's all more, more or less written up in the book. Uh, you can get a nice copy of it, feel free. And with that, I am going to stop and, and answer questions. Questions from, our, questions from our audience in person? There's one in the corner. <clears throat> For, the, for those of you back home, we have a guy in the far, of course, he sits in the far left corner, <laughs> as far away from the microphone as he possibly can, so it's taking a little bit of time. Yes, sir, don't feel badly that we had, a, uh, yes, sir. She needed the exercise. Yeah, she, I, she needed the exercise, anyway. I can tell. Uh, I talked to someone yesterday, worked at a lab for a while, said that there used to be things very small in nuclear, like bullets and stuff. Like nuclear uh, bullets? Nuclear, nuclear bullets? That, yeah, I don't well, know if that's I true. <laughs> I'm not sure. That's, uh, that's pretty what hard to get a... What was the smallest no, nuclear well, weapon? Well, now maybe he means uh, the military did start using what they called depleted uranium for ammunition. And the advantage, the, the reason why they would use depleted, now depleted uranium is uranium in which you've extracted out the uranium-235, so it's only uranium-238, so it's, it's not going to become a bomb, a nuclear bomb. But um, it does have an extremely high density and so if a uranium bullet strikes a metal tank, for example, or a metal object, it has much more of an impact than a lead bullet or a, uh, or a copper bullet or some other material bullet. And so it penetrates. It, has a more, it more readily would penetrate into the target. And so some ammunition, mostly anti-armor ammunition used by the Army, I know, perhaps also by the Navy and the, and the Air Force, uh, they have developed special ammunition that has this penetrating capability. Maybe that's what he's talking about. It's just the density of uranium. There's no fission taking place. No, it passes not at all. Tank. No, it's strictly classical impact. You just, you got impact. You got the momentum. Uh, because of the greater density, the greater mass of that bullet, it carries more impact when it hits. Uh, the last question I have is I also read, I read your book, and uh, also Thank the you. one by Herb York about making weapons and talking peace. Right. And in the end, around 1980, he talked about how they haven't really solved the overlying problem of getting out of this where mutual destruction is our own way um, to can create peace. Have we gotten any closer to solving the problem? Well, OK, a little background, though. because uh, back Herb York came out here, and he, he met with us, weapons designers, in the 1980s, early 1980s. Uh, at the time, I believe he was the chancellor of the uh, University of California, San Diego. And he came up, and he met, he met with us designers, and he started talking about that. And York, at the time, was very much got involved with arms control type uh, activities going on. And so, I, in my opinion now, listening to him, uh, having read, I read the same book, read his autobiography, read his other writings, certainly read everything he had written while he was director, um, York took on a, 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 a position that now that we've achieved more or less parity, or we've achieved a substantial a, a capability within our nuclear stockpile, based on a lot of the work that happened while York was directed by the way, the Polaris uh, development, by the way, 
So now we need to think, how do we more wisely use this? We don't, don't go maddeningly off building as many as we can. How do we now leverage this to come up with a uh, reasonable amount of, we keep our own security, but keep everything under control so it's not a runaway thing. At the passions at the time were running and such that what that made York an anti-nuke and he was now, you know, and so people were um, ascribing to Herb York things I don't think were true. He was, I don't think he was ever a pacifist in the sense that he, he did not want us to have a very strong nuclear deterrent, this, that, and the other thing. I think what he's trying to say is, well, look, we're, we're getting there. We, we now have the capability of destroying the Soviet Union. So how do we wisely use this to limit the number of weapons so that, so that we have a more reasonable thing between us and the Soviet Union in that sense? And in that sense, he did become uh, at odds with some political speakers and things at the time. But my own personal opinion, I, York was always, uh, by the way, I later found out, uh, Joe, Joe and I are veterans here, but York played a very key role in starting the X-ray laser program in the Reagan administration. So anyone that says he was a super peacenik uh, do not know Herb York very well, but he, he really was a key person in, in starting up um, a strategic defense initiative. So all those things, I, I think it's misunderstood. We have one more, at least. Yes, sir. Um, I'm not sure if this is, you know, something that can be answered here, but um, if so, uh, were the Plowshare Project devices um, weapons designed, or were they more of some of the offshoots, or did they have a separate kind of design? Can you say the first thing? What? Oh, the Plowshare. Uh, Plowshare. Tests? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I, I skipped over it, didn't mm -hmm. I? Um, do you want me to go into that? Yes, were they the same kind of, or were they actual weapons, you know, that they were <laughs> using, or were they totally Are you trying to designs? send me to jail? You want me or, to answer well, this? That's You're what I'm gonna, saying. You, I don't know. You want can... the police to come in here and, and put me to jail. Uh, I'll sure tell you what I can tell you. <laughs> All right, let, here's what I know about Plowshare. Uh, the original ideas come from a physicist at Los Alamos, actually, from what I can see. And his original ideas were not necessarily directed towards classic Plowshare things, but it was to more cheaply conduct nuclear tests. His idea was to, I think as I recall, you create a big cavity in the Arctic ice and you you'd conduct a nuclear test inside this big cavity and then the, um, then the, uh, the, the walls of the cavity, of course, melt real quickly, come down, but, 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 but you know, you, you can very quickly get on and get uh, do things and do other things. And that led to ideas of, well, in nuclear tests, if we create cavities and tunnels in that, the same thing, you reduce, you're reducing the strain on the surrounding soil and you can, you can reuse these things to an extent. Then the idea came up of, well, could we use the nuclear energy for things other than for a weapon? And in that sense, it does call for things. Now, I have a really funny uh, anecdote to me. Uh, involving George Menchin, my, my mentor, and, uh, and Edward Teller, actually, President Eisenhower. Uh, but the idea came about, could you use, one, one early idea was, well, could you use nuclear explosives to create big craters? And if you had a line of these craters, you could create a canal, uh, create a canal, or you can create a natural harbor or that. And uh, that, be, that did catch on. And, um, and there were a series of tests in the late 1950s. One was called GNOME, or in German, GNOME. And it was in New Mexico, in, um, near um, the caverns. Where's the big cavern? Carlsbad, thank you. Near the Carlsbad Caverns. And this was a salt deposit or something. And it's what I call the 1950s version of fracking, basically, where you would use a nuclear blast it was, a, it was something on the order of five to eight kilotons, but you use a nuclear blast, and that would you use that energy to separate minerals from the rock, and then you then you created a process to extract the minerals from the cavity that you constructed below ground, and the gnome the gnome device did that. They they tested it, seemed to work. Everything seemed to work. They did another test in Louisiana. I don't know how many Louisianians know that we conducted a nuclear test in Louisiana. Um, but the bigger tests were in Nevada, at the Nevada test site, where we created, created 
craters, and I think that was in line for creating that uh, 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 new uh, canal across the isthmus, you know, that would vie with the Panama Canal, but it would be a sea level canal. And so there were several tests that did that. The big one is Sudan, of course, the, the culmination. Gene Burke, by the way, for posterity, uh, uh, the nuclear weapons designer for that was Gene Burke, an A division guy. Um, <clears throat> And, but a lot of work went into, uh, it is surprising how much it, there was not, they kept the radioactivity down, there were no radioactive clouds, there were no, none of the stuff you, know, you usually associate with the 1950s, big nuclear tests, nope. The, you know, people today can grow, go right up to the Sudan crater, you know, there's, there's not all that much radioactivity going on, and boom, boom, boom. And now, this is where it gets a little bit cheeky. Yes, there were people, Mike May, Harold Brown, I've read some other guys wrote articles back in the 50s and 60s about how they could really come up with some extraordinarily innovative nuclear devices that could be used for excavation or plowshare type devices. And that's where I'm not going to talk to you about because those, those, those are a little bit too much into the secret realm. But um, people like Harold, Harold Brown wrote a paper on making a power plant using nuclear explosions for a power plant, for example. Uh, Mike May came up with an exquisite, uh, boy, could, Mike had this phenomenal mind, but he had this exquisite uh, theoretical thought about how you could do this more efficiently and all that. But it, 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 anyway, uh, Plowshare kind of died, I think, from political. Uh, Kennedy was a big fan of it, by the way, for what, for what it's worth. Kennedy actually saw a lot, a lot of advantages to go on. After his assassination, I don't, Lyndon Johnson, I don't think, shared that or was uninterested or Vietnam was becoming too big an issue, whatever. But it kind of died during the Kennedy years. So, Tom, we have um, one comment that I think is, uh, is, is the perfect comment to, to end the entire series on. But um, the participant said, we owe Tom immense gratitude for summarizing years of research, peppering it with anecdotes and a pinch of physics to bring this eight-part series to all of us. Go Army. So, um, so thank you so much. I'm so delighted that we have this all recorded now. People can enjoy it. We will be doing um, encouraging summer students to uh, view the series and then hopefully have you back to do a Q&A with the students to, um, so they too can ask questions and, and experience this firsthand. So thank you so much and thank you all for joining us. My pleasure. <laughs>